really glad to be here. Uh, I am going to share my desktop now and change to the slides. Okay. Um, I just want to say first that um, feel free to, um, it would really, really help since I cannot see your faces um, to like, if you can share emojis or something to let me know if you're following, if, if you're confused, like if I need to stop and to re-explain some things, please let me know um, cause, because I don't have any other way to, to do this. And the important thing here is that you can follow and understand and hopefully find it useful. Uh, and it's not about talking to myself about something I did. So um, this is um, a work that I did um, for a paper, uh, an applied paper in a field of science, and I'm going to go through the examples with that. And now I'm just going to talk about, um, I'm going to try to make, start, start doing it very general. So we're going to talk about finding hidden topic model, uh, hidden topics in documents. And we'll talk about the analysis that are needed before and after that. And if you want, we can talk about other text analysis as well later. Um, I'm okay. We're going to talk about. Can can you see very? Can you see well my presentation? Yes. Okay. So there are several things that you can do in terms of extracting information from text. And with, I know you had uh, this talk from Ella who showed you some of these things. So I'm just going to quickly mention some of them. So like checking word frequency, word cloud, sentiment analysis, topic modeling. In terms of word frequency, I think you, the ones who went to, to this meetup was, uh, she showed some examples of how to extract words from text and count them with some functions in R. Here, I just took an example uh, from a website. You can see the link there um, where they count not only words, but you can also count um, joint words, uh, what we call n-grams. So in this case, bigrams, so groups of two words together and how frequently they are mentioned in the text. And this is an example from um, the Sorcerer's Stone from Harry Potter and the frequency of the most mentioned words. I think this is from a subset of the text. So this is something that can be done with text analysis in R. Word clouds. Um, you, you also saw uh, word clouds as a tool to represent uh, the importance of a word, importance in terms of frequency of a word in the, in the text. And that gives you a very quick idea in this case of which are the key words, you know, in a Harry Potter uh, book, well, uh, it, it's logic to expect that Harry is going to be a very strong and very important word in the book. So these are word clouds and there are several libraries in R to do it. And I'm gonna show an, uh, the example of the one I used, and I think it's the same that Ella used. Sentiment analysis. Um, I, I think that, so in sentiment analysis, the idea is to be able to extract from text um, some feelings of positive and negative, and maybe some other information. And that's by using some methods that usually rely on dictionaries to recognize if the words in the text are about positive or negative feelings. And here I copied, I copied one tweet um, that uh, mentioned some words that I think we can agree that are positive, brilliant, talented, kind. This was about um, our ladies uh, seeing each other at our studio conf. So it's very easy to read this and see that it's a positive tweet overall. Uh, but if you have a lot of documents, a lot of tweets, and you want to see which ones are more about negative things or positive things, and have a quick read to know like if you're organizing 
our latest conferences or our studio conference, see, okay, what do people like and what people didn't like, uh, sentiment analysis would be uh, a way to go. So I can surely take questions about these three things later, uh, and I'm gonna make a pause for that. Uh, but because I know they have been presented before, today I'm gonna focus more on topic modeling. So this is an example that I just made up for this talk. And I imagined that um, you could have in the meetup page a question saying, why would you participate in Our Ladies? And I created these three examples of uh, responses that people could have. Like, I like to be part of a group. We can learn together. They teach us new things in R. Uh, I think that people could give uh, responses like this or maybe even larger, longer responses. And okay, if we have three answers, it's easy to, to analyze them, to interpret them. But if we have very long ones and from a lot of people say that in, this is for our ladies global and there are like thousands of people giving answers, one, uh, way to analyze open answers or answers to open questions would be to um, kind of come up with topics that they are talking about. And we could identify words that are more connected to some topics than others. Like, for instance, you have part, group, together, you have learn, teach, new and you may think that these words are connected to these two topics community and learning and that there are some answers that are going to be only related to one topic like some people will um, answer thinking about just one aspect that they want to talk about like i like to be part of a group could be only a person that joins our ladies only because they care about being part of a community. There would be another person that says, they teach us new things in R, and that person would only join our ladies because they want to learn new things in R. But there could be other people that care about these two aspects, and they say, we, we can learn things together. So they're talking about learning and community. So what I'm trying to say is that if imagine if you have thousands of answers and people have been free to ask and to reply however they wanted, a good way to analyze them is to try to find the hidden topics behind those answers, behind whatever type of document you have. There are some topics, there are some topics in people's minds and the words that are there can give some information about those, those topics. And this is what I'm going to talk about today and how to do this in R. There are several ways to do topic analysis and I'm going to focus on the one that I have applied and that I remember the most, which is called Latin Dirichlet Allocation, LDA. And this is a statistical model. It's a way to model documents. So a statistical or mathematical model is a representation of reality in a mathematical or statistical way. Here is, it is the same thing. You're trying to represent documents in a, in a statistical way. And these are the characteristics. So behind, the idea is that behind the, the documents, in this case, we're going to consider that each reply to the question, why participate in Our Ladies, is a document. So it can be as short as the answers that I presented here, or a document can be a book as well. Um, so the idea is that behind each document, there can be a number of latent topics, of hidden topics. As in the examples here, I said, probably talking about community and learning, those could be the two topics. So the idea is that behind the documents, there are latent topics. 
the choice of words in the documents are related to the topics. And that would mean that we can define a topic by its composition of mixtures of words. And so the model is going to take into account all of this, the fact that we can represent a, docu a document is composed by words, and these words are related to the topics. The choice of words are related to the topics. You are not going to say together if you are not referring to community. Um, and the model is going to give us as an output different compositions of mixtures of words. So if I want for these three documents, which were the answers to the question, why participate in Our Ladies? And I say, I want to identify two topics because you have to, uh, you have to specify the number of topics you want. If you say, I want two topics, then the output of the model is going to be a mixture of words for each topic. And you are the one as a user that has to interpret these compositions and give them a name. And in, in this case, I said, oh, the topic that is about powered group and together, we're gonna call it community. And the topic that is about learn, teach, and new, we're gonna cut it, uh, call it learning. So this is the idea. So what to do in practice to do topic analysis? These are five steps that I think are necessary. Uh, the first one is to define what is a document in my case. And in the example that I showed, a document would be a response, one response to the question, why participate in our ladies? Two, we should get the set of documents. Once, once we have defined what our documents are, we have to get them. Like get the replies uh, for this question. If this is on a website, it's very easy to extract them, probably because we created the website, so we know how to extract them quickly. But the set of documents could be books that are either, either in a digital library or we have to scan them and extract the text. So depending on what your document is, it will be harder or easier to get the set of documents. Three, pre-process the documents. So as with any type of analysis, once you get the data, you have to clean the data before the analysis. In this case, it's, it is the same. And the pre-processing basically consists on filtering out non-informative words, like prepositions, like in every single answer or in every single text, you would probably use prepositions, but that doesn't lead you to identify a topic that's not informative to identifying topics. And lemmatizing, which is basically um, identifying the roots of the word and the sense of the word, uh, like um, um, probably good, great, better, have the same meaning and you want to recognize them as just one word uh, saying plant or plants in plural they are probably attached to the same topic and you want to, them to be recognized as just one uh, so lemmatizing does that i think i'm gonna go more into details later about that one showing the the examples and then once you have filtered out words and lemmatized. Uh, you prepare the input for the Latin Dirichlet allocation model, which is a list of words per document and the frequency of each word in each document. Once you have that ready, then you can fit the model with a fixed number of topics. And the, f the number of topics depends on what you're thinking, like what would be convenient to you to interpret, or you can use a statistical selection criterion. And I'm gonna quickly go through that in an example. Uh, and after you do the model fitting and the parameters are estimated, you can use those outputs to interpret the topics. And I, um, we can see that uh, in the example again. 
And I think this is, yes, this is a time where we can pause if you have questions now. Um, yeah. I think there were two questions. Uh, can you see them? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, can the word clouds be adjusted according to relevancy? Um, yes. Can you, the word clouds are, the word clouds are uh, an example in which basically here's the example and I said that um, the area is proportional to frequency, but actually you define which variable uh, would be proportional to the area or the size of the font, depending on the package that you're using. Um, so if you want it to be a measure of relevancy somehow, you can, instead of using frequency, you can use relevancy and you just put that column. You just have to make sure that you have in your data frame that you have a list of words uh, and a column that is um, representing the variable that you want to that you want it to be uh, used for font size or uh, area. So if that variable is relevancy and you're able to measure relevancy for all of the words, then yes, you can do it. I hope that that was clear, and if not, feel free to ask again. Okay. Uh, are there any tools for automatic limitization or should it be always done manually? There is, I use a function and we will go through the example later and I'll show you which function I'm using. Um, it is still, limit, limitization is still a field of research. So there is no perfect limitization. Um, so so yeah, the one I use, I have checked visually and I, it c seems to work, not perfectly for me, but for the things that I'm trying to do, it kind of works okay. Uh, I'm not a linguistic uh, researcher, so I cannot tell you about all the different methods that there are for limitization, but this is relatively new in terms of computing, statistical computing, um, um, programming. Uh, and I think that in the future we will have more options for limitization. Okay, if this is all, I'll go through the example. So the example I'm going to present is about something that probably none of you have ever heard, but that's, that's where I work on, um, and that's movement ecology. Movement ecology is a field of science and I'm going to explain quickly what it is. And the idea that I, the thing that I investigated and that I'm particularly going to present today is I wanted to identify the main topics in this particular field of science in the last decade. So in the last decade, which have been the main topics in this field of science? So the idea behind uh, movement ecology is that um, we investigate how, how, where, and influenced by what animals move, and animals and humans. So um, in the past, people had to spend time observing animals, but now there, is, there are also uh, tracking devices like GPS, accelerometers, and so on, that allow uh, animals, and I would say also humans, to be tracked, and their movements are tracked, and you can get some relevant information from the movement patterns. Um, so yeah, we, we, there are a lot of different studies of um, what do, do animals do, like what are their strategies to get some food, collective motion, um, um, people doing like sport activities or fishing vessels. How do animals and humans get to move? Like how the muscles help for swimming or running? Um, how do animals and people know where to go and why do they go to different places? What do they use to, to move around, to go from one place to another? Um, animal migration. So there are a lot of different questions 
that are studied in this field called movement ecology. And again, the idea was to understand which were the main topics uh, in the last decade. So 10 years of research. I want to uh, shout out to my collaborators for this particular research uh, and that um, I'm really grateful for their help. I, for this presentation, I looked uh, in the dictionary, I wanted to make sure that I was writing collaborator in, in the right way. So I put collaborator in the dictionary. This is the Cambridge dictionary. And I found the, the first meaning is a person who works with an enemy who has taken control of their country, uh, which is not really what I wanted to say about them. And the second meaning made a, a little bit more sense. A person who works together with others for a special purpose. So just in case, because I'm Peruvian, my native language is Spanish, um, I just want to say when I want to thank my collaborators, I mean this and not enemies who have taken control of their countries. So going back to topic analysis, um, before the small break, I said that there were like five points that we have, to, we have to do in order to do topic analysis, from defining what a document is to interpreting the topics. So for this example in movement ecology, I'm going to go through all of these uh, points. The first thing is to define what is a document. In my case, um, because I was going to examine the research in the field in the last 10 years, I defined a document to be an abstract of a movement ecology paper. That was my unit of research in terms of documents. Second step, get the set of documents. And okay, so I didn't have all, all the movement ecology papers with me. I needed to use a, a search engine. And there are several search engines um, on the web. And I used Web of Science First, I wanted to use Google Scholar, uh, but there are two things that I didn't like. The first thing is that if you use Google Scholar to search for papers, what I have seen in my experience is that you get three times the number of actual research papers, like three times in terms of number of results, because there will be duplicates and there will also be um, um, things that are not really research papers. There could be presentations or there could be notes or sometimes a blog post would appear there. Uh, yes, white papers and other things. And, and, and then the second reason was that I kind of tried to extract the information and it seems that Google, uh, Google Scholar has developed in time, continues to develop defense systems in order to avoid people to extract. Um, yeah, uh, so, and I know that there's a Python library that is doing it, but I have seen through the issues that sometimes people get to like extract all the papers and then Google Scholar gets a new uh, strategy to block them. <laughs> so, uh, and then you can't do it anymore. So I decided, okay, don't go through Google Scholar and I would go through the web of science uh, through the University of Florida, where I work right now, I have access to this. So I just had to come up with keywords um, and search for the right topic. And I was able to download at least uh, 500 by 500, uh, all the results. So that's what I used. And I will give you an example. I wanna show you an example of the query results that I get like raw data that I get from uh, Web of Science. This is the kind of uh, data that I get. So it's a text file. And what you see here, you don't have to um, read all the details, but what you see here is, are the results. And then you get until here where you see a blank space, that's the first result, so one paper. And it gives you information about uh, authors, um, the uh, journal, which language, um, keywords, abstract, 
remember this is what I'm interested in, that's my document, the abstract, uh, and other things. One of the things that I really, I was interested in was an identifier for each document, because that's what I need to, like something that helps me identify like an ID, and the DO, that's the DOI, the Digital Object Identifier. So this is what I get, right? This, I, uh, I got one file per uh, 500 uh, results. And I had to clean it in R and I think, yeah, we could go to the website. There's a website that I think you all have the link to it and that kind of uh, shows everything I did for this research. Uh, if you go to this section, uh, which is data collection and processing, there's a part where I explain my kind of algorithm to define keywords for the web of science and be happy about those keywords. One of the challenges uh, for my research was that most papers in movement ecology do not say movement ecology in the paper. So you have to come up with other words to identify them. So this is how I defined a movement ecology paper the search words that I was happy with, and the journals that I looked at. And this is in cleaning and filtering results in R. You have an explanation, the package that I'm using. This uh, One of my collaborators is a co-author in this package. And what it does is it, one of the things it, it, it can do is to take the raw data from Web of Science, the ones that I just showed you, and it easily converts it in R into a friendlier data frame. Um, and the code to do that, you can find it clicking here. Um, there's some quality control and blah, blah. So that's, that's where you can find all the code for this part that I'm not gonna show here unless you have questions later uh, because I am more interested in going through the other parts. Um, okay, next. Okay, so after that search, after I defined the keywords and everything, I ended up, and cleaning a little bit, uh, I ended up with more than 8,000 abstracts, which is, which kind of justifies the fact that I can, I need to um, do text analysis, like, Honestly, my brain cannot handle information from more than 8,000 abstracts and be able to, oh, identify topics and write a paper on it. Like, I cannot. So I need, I need R or a machine to do that. So next, I'm going to go through the next three steps, which are uh, pre-processing, fitting the model, and interpreting the topics. And again, going to, should we go to the website? Yeah, OK. <clears throat> Um, so this is section three in the website. I explain different things. Here we are interested in topic analysis. Uh, you see that I explain what the model is about with some references. And let's go to pre-processing. So I said that there were like two key things there about cleaning the data. Here I uh, give more details and I uh, specify four steps. So first, removing redundant words uh, for identifying topics, which were prepositions and numbers. Uh, those were the main ones. So a word that is just a number is not informative of a topic. The second thing is that I was doing this re research in English, which um, makes it easier because there are a lot more tools for text analysis in, in English than in any other language. Uh, but I still had at least two different styles of English, which were British and American. And I wanted to put them in the same level uh, to like convert all words either to British or to American. And I chose American because I wanted the same words. Like when you say color, you in, in I think it's in American, I always confuse them, but I think it's in American where you do C-O-L-O-R and in British, where you do C-O-L-O-U-R. And I wanted to tell my model that those were the same word. Um, so I 
we're going to see the function that I use to convert to the same kind of English. Third step, lemmatizing, and I explained it better here. The idea is to extract the lemma of a word based on its intended meaning with the aim of grouping words under the same lemma. And there's a, a reference there. And the fourth step is to filter out the words that were only used once in the whole set of abstracts. Why do we do that? Because we want to uh, filter out noise. Things that are only used once uh, in, in the eight, more than 8,000 abstracts uh, are just going to increase the number of words that the model has to uh, work with. And it's just giving noise, not information. If, you, there's, if the word appears only once, then it's not going to help identifying general topics for all the abstracts. Um, I'm mentioning here that I'm using for this part, uh, tidy text, TM, and text stem packages uh, as the key packages. We can go now to R, and I'll show you um, what this is about. Oh, by the way, um, this website is, um, so you can click and get uh, all the, um, the uh, codes. Like if you click here, you can open the file of the code and you will open it in your text editor or wherever you wanna open it. You can also go to the GitHub repository of this website. Do I have it open? Yes, I do. Um, so it, this is the repository. So you go to my website, rocioho slash um, move echo review. And then in R, you'll find all the scripts. So <clears throat> one of the scripts, um, and I can send you the link later if you remind me, of that. Um, so we're going to start with this script, which is cleaning words topic modeling. Uh, the first part is where I indicate the paths, the different paths where my data are. So I'm gonna run this path. Uh, I mentioned the libraries that I'm using, tidy, tidyverse, tidy text, string R, TM, text stem, that's where the lemmatizing function is. Um, and I use some auxiliary functions. I'm going to open this one, cleaning words abstract, in a little bit. And um, this is the Americanizing function that I talked to you about, which basically uses a dictionary that converts every British word to American words. And then I call the papers or the documents that I have. And the documents as I have them are looking like this. This may be too small, but there's one row per document. And there are informations. I don't use all of this for, for topic modeling. But there's like information like the authors, title, journal, keywords, uh, the abstract is here and that's what we need. And we have the identifier is here. I kind of cleaned it, but that's the idea of the DOI. Um, so that's what the data looks like. I had a little bit more than the last decade. So I just filter to get from um, 2008 to 2000. 19, 18, yeah. No, from 2009 to 2018. Um, then I only extract the um, columns that I am interested in, which are basically the DOI, the identifier, and the abstract. And now I'm going to use the cleaning words abstract uh, function. Uh, and because this is going to take some time, it gives us time to go through the function. And I'm going to explain you what this is doing. So what this is entering is a, a directory and uh, our, let's say data frame, it's, I think it's a table um, with the identifier and the abstract. And we use first 
uh, we separate the abstracts by word. Um, and we do it with the function and nest tokens. And we expect, uh, we specify that the token, so the um, linguistic unit that we're interested in are words. So that the abstract have to be, have to be uh, split it by words. So that's the first thing. When we have split it by words, we are going to use the anti join function and say we want to get rid of stop words. So stop words are, most of them are prepositions. But if you go uh, through the libraries, and I'm really sorry, but I forgot if it's tidy text or string R or TM. Um, and I can't run it right now. <clears throat> but if you go through the documentation, it will tell you exactly um, what criteria it uses to identify stop words. And I think that this is something that was um, discussed during Ella's presentation. Okay, so those are the things that it automatically removes. But I, through my own analysis, I found some other words that appeared a lot in the abstracts that uh, were not useful for identifying topics. So I made a list of something that I called bad words, uh, which were not useful words, and I also asked the algorithm to remove them, which is what I'm doing here. Uh, then I wanted to remove words that were numbers. Uh, and this is how I did it. I'm not an expert in regex expressions, and this is the link where I got um, this, like I got instructions on how to remove the numbers. Um, I also noted later that uh, there were some other non-informative words, which are e.g. E um, IE, which are to either to give exam examples or explanations, and I wanted them out. So I removed those ones as well. <laughs> and other things that um, I wanted to, like sometimes I would get KM and sometimes I would get kilometer and I wanted to um, tell my model later that those were the same words. So every time I saw a word that was KM, I wanted it to convert it into kilometer. Same thing with other words. And here's what, when I use uh, the dictionary, uh, American to British, uh, I have it in a CSV. Uh, I read it and then I use the Americanizing function, which basically looks for a word that is in the British, in the British column of the dictionary. And if the word is there, it means that it, there's an abstract that is using this word in British English and it's to be converted to the word in American. And the dictionary is something I found uh, on a website, not as the form of a dictionary, but the words were there. And the, the function is something I created. It's very simple and it's uh, on this repository. So I did that and I, uh, in my data frame, I added a column that uh, is word AM, which means the American uh, version of the word. And then I did the lemmatizing part. And that is uh, done with the function lemmatize words. Uh, that again, it's from text stem. So I used that and I added a new column to my data frame with the lemmatized version. And then I did a, a few more corrections by hand because there were some words that were not being recognized as the same lemma and I wanted to tell my model later, hey, these are the same. So I did this by hand. Then I saw that after those corrections, there were some words left still with numbers because we separated differently because we lemmatized and so on. So again, I removed words that were only about numbers. And then I saw that there were also words in Spanish. Um, and the 
Why this happened? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, because first of all, all the abstracts were um, uh, associated with papers in English. In some cases, we would have the, the abstract version of in Spanish, but that was not very often. But the thing is that in some cases, uh, people did field work in Latin America. And also, uh, you may know this, um, there were some parts, there are some parts of the US that have num uh, names in Spanish because either like Florida was from Spain and the US took it. Um, California, Texas was from Mexico. Uh, so you still have the, the names in Spanish. So sometimes we would have like play, a place called, I don't know, Las Olas and Las as a preposition would stay there and be very frequency, frequent because there would be another place called Las and another place called Las whatever. Uh, and when I, first when I use the stop word function, it's a function um, in English. So it, we only recognize sub words in English. So uh, at this stage, I, th I realized that we had some words in Spanish that were not informative for topics. So I removed them. And that's what the cleaning words abstract function does. So we, uh, we run this and this is what we have. This is TF words, maybe too small. <laughs> to see, but um, the idea is that we have one row per word in a document. So first column is uh, ID of the document. Second column is word. So you will have the list of words. Remember, not all words. We removed a lot of words. Uh, third column would be the Americanized version. So if it's the same as the British version, it would be the same word. And the fourth column would be the Americanized and lemmatized word. And in some cases, it's the same. And in other cases, it's uh, a bit different because it has been lemmatized. Like interactions becomes interaction, plants become plant, and, and so on. Um, underlying becomes underlie. And those are the ones that we're going to use for the topics, the lemmatized version. Uh, so once we've done that, um, I said that the other thing I wanted was to get rid of the words that only appeared once. Um, so this is what I'm doing with these lines. We extract the words, we uh, count the words, and we extract the ones that only appeared once, and we remove them. And then we have final data. And the final data it looks like this, um, which is just very simple. Um, it is um, the data frame, and I think it's a, it's a table. It's composed of um, a column for the uh, document identifier and each word. So you would see that um, here we have plant for this document. And we have in line nine, we have plant for the same document again because it appeared twice. Uh, so we will have every single word. If it appears several times, it will appear several times in our lines. And in this case, I ended up with uh, a little bit more than a million rows. So that's how we cleaned the data. And now, going to close this. And now, well, this little part is just to, I'm going to show you the first part, which is basically I said that um, LDA or Latin direct led allocation models need as inputs words and counts. So in the end, we're going to take the data uh, here and we're going to count per document. Uh, and then we're going to transform into the object class that works with this kind of model, which is a document term matrix. So from the table, we're going to pass to a document term matrix uh, with this function cast uh, DTM, where we specify uh, which one is the document identifier column, 
the actual term that we're interested in, which is the column word. This is the lemmatized version. And the value, which is the frequency of the word in each document. This is, so up to now we have done uh, this part, pre-process the documents, uh, which means filtering out words and preparing the input for LDA. Now we're gonna fit uh, the LDA and I just wanna check if I need to explain something about, well, if you need more details about the actual model and the parameterization of the model, um, there's a very short explanation on the website. So it says that, um, so because we're, statistically, I don't know if you, don't, if you want the details, but um, here I go. Uh, if, you, if you want uh, to estimate parameters of a model where you have variables that you don't have any values from, uh, and in this case, the topics, like you don't know any of the topics and you're still gonna estimate their parameters, um, you are going to need some kind of uh, optimization algorithm, like a numerical optimization. So there are several types of uh, estimation methods and you can check the documentation of the package called topics, topic models. Um, yeah, there are some references here. And um, so we use this estimation method, VEM, uh, which is variational uh, expectation maximization algorithm to do the estimates. And because it's a numerical optimization, you will not always have the same results. Um, and it can be a little bit unstable. So what I did was to run 20 replicates of the models and kept, and kept the one with the highest likelihood. So this, I'm gonna show what I did for this. Um, yes, yeah, so, and then I discuss here um, the, the choice for the number of Latin topics, because as I said, you have to tell the model how many topics you think there are. Uh, so that it can look for those topics. Like it can, it has to know if you're looking for two topics or three topics and then try to find the most likely topics in terms of their composition of words. Um, and then here I discuss, if you have absolutely no idea of how many topics you want, you can use some uh, measures like the per perplexity score. And then I discuss why I didn't use it. So in the end, we wanted to fix the number of topics to 15 because um, I tried, so for, th for this exercise, I tried five, 10, 15, 20, 25. And so I fitted LDAs for all of those. And then I realized that with five or 10, we got topics that were so general that they weren't saying much and with 20 or 25, the topics were so particular that we were actually not sure of what we were seeing there. And if they were like kind of um, influenced by very specific cases, it was hard to interpret as well. So 15 seemed to be a reasonable value. Um, so yes. So this is what, and you're gonna see how to put this parameter into the model. So now let's go to the model. Here are some um, arguments that I need because as I said, I did 20 replicates and I know that my computer had, has several cores. So to make it run faster, I decided to do some parallelization. You don't have to do this, but it, it made me wait less. So um, I asked R to detect the number of cores and to use all of them but four so that I could do other stuff at the same time. And then I started the cluster. So here I used the package parallel. <coughs> I started the, pack, uh, the, the cluster for parallelization and I used the function par l apply that's how I did the parallelization. I said for this cluster and I want 20 replicates and rep is 20 here in line 32. 
And then the only function that I used for fitting the model was actually this one, LDA. So in LDA, uh, the arguments are uh, the data, which is, as you hopefully remember, the document term matrix, uh, in which we had the document uh, ID, word, and frequency by document. The number of topics. So this is where you um, fix the number of topics. Uh, and here I said it, it's 15. The methods for parameter estimation, if you don't put the method, there's a, there's a method by default and I don't remember if it's the VM or another one, but this should be in the documentation and some other parameters if you want to like go into the details and tell the model a little bit more of how you expect the topics to be associated to the documents. Um, so this is the, uh, the function and I run all of this. And then once I had 20 models, because I run 20 replicates, I asked to take the one, uh, sorry, here. I asked to take the one that had maximum likelihood. So that's what I, what I did. And I'm not gonna run this right now because it's gonna take time. So I'm just gonna go directly to the outputs. And before that, um, let me know if I'm going too fast or um, yeah, if I need to re-explain something. So we have done step four, which is feeding the models. And now we're going to learn how to interpret the models and thus how to interpret the topics. There are two key outputs that we're going to see uh, in a minute from the fitted models. Um, we're going to start with the first one. So one key output is beta. Beta uh, represents the probabilities of having a word in a document given the presence of a certain topic. So um, it can, it can be considered as a proxy of the importance of a word in a topic. If beta is high, it means that this word has a higher probability to be, to appear in a document, given that the document want to, wants to address a certain topic. So if you are writing an abstract, move in ecology, and you wanna talk about the methods, there's a, a very high probability that you're going to include the word model in the document. So this output connects um, the words to topics. It helps providing a proxy of importance of a word in a topic. And at the beginning of the presentation, when I was talking about topic modeling, I said that a topic can be defined and composed of a mixture of words. So we are actually gonna use this information of the beta values. Uh, there are, again, proxies of the importance of a word in the topic to plot them as word clouds and that will help us to interpret the topics and to put labels on them. So here you can see the word clouds for each of the topics, remember I fixed 15 topics and I plotted all the words, well, not all the words, the ones that were had higher beta value, I filter out the ones that had very poor beta values. So the most important words uh, in each topic and the, the area that they occupy in the word clouds is proportional to their beta values. It's proportional to their importance in the topic. And I use this graphical representation to interpret the topics. Um, we're gonna go through some of the examples um, because I have here the labels. So let's say for instance, nine acoustic telemetry. So here we have very big fish, but then we also have behavior 
acoustic, river, sound, bat, fish and bat. So it's, um, it is, it is a, a topic that is mostly related to acoustic telemetry and bats generate um, ultrasound. So that it's, all, it's with acoustic telemetry that you can study bats as well. Um, let's see here, 12. We have bird, migration, migratory, flight, bat again, wind, sight, route, uh, and we, this is 12, and we labeled this one because of this composition of words, avian migration. Um, let's see, 15. Uh, we have turtle, whale, nest, very big, breed, behavior again, uh, adult, egg, juvenile, and that's why we lab labeled this one breeding ecology, because it's about uh, laying eggs, having the, the little ones grow, uh, juveniles and so on, leave the nest, um, yeah. Then we have, for instance, 13. You have train, player, speed, distance, performance, team, match, run, and we named this one sports. Because we considered in the movement ecology papers, as I presented movement ecology, uh, for me at least, it's about the study of individuals and why they move and how they move and so on. So it involves animals and humans and we decided to also take into account abstracts of uh, human studies. This is why we have like one that is about sports and this one with female, male, physical activity, sex and so on was about human activity patterns. And we can talk later about ways in which we checked, we kind of checked the consistencies uh, of these topics if you have questions later about that. So that is one type of output that we got from the LDA and that helped us to interpret the topics and label them. The other key output is called gamma and gamma are the probabilities of a topic being referred to in each document. So the probability that a document would address a certain topic. Now we thought if we sum all of the gammas from all of the documents for each topic, uh, then we will have some kind of like the popularity of each topic in the whole set of documents. So we ranked, we used the gammas to rank uh, our topics by popularity or prevalence. And this is what we got. So social interactions first, movement models, habitat selection, and so on, so on, so on. And uh, we also calculated this gamma by year and we had a sense of how the topics could have been evolving throughout the, de the, de the decade. So we see that there's not much change. There's a, bit, a little bit more of uh, movement models and there's certainly a lot more of sports. And this is very uh, consistent with articles talking about human mobility and saying that uh, it was not so long ago that tracking devices started to be very, very popular for human beings. And a lot of methods, uh, mostly machine learning methods, have been developed to analyze um, these incredible volumes of data. So uh, everything that is about human mobility is increasing. Um, there are a lot more studies and we are probably going to see a lot more. So yeah, I have, yeah, I have all this stuff, but I would say we can stop here and maybe answer some questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we had, uh, uh, well, there was uh, one question um, which wasn't uh, answered. So there was uh, a, a question about uh, split R 
if that uh, works for Scopus reference output or only for the Web of Science? From what I remember, it also works with Scopus. You want to ch double check that, but I think it does. Okay. Uh, so there would be particular um, functions, one for Scopus and one for Web of Science. Uh, okay, um, I was just wondering more about this LDA model. Uh, I mean, I understand that um, uh, that that you created the topics uh, based on your output, uh, based on the on the word clouds. Um, so, so, but I, I was just uh, wondering if, uh, if with LDA there is some kind of a, I don't know, theoretical basis behind it as well, or, or it's it's just based on a lot of empiri empirical analysis, uh, how how the model has been constructed, or, yeah. But I can maybe read more about it uh, on, from your references as well. Yeah, you, I mean, it's 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 good if you can read something. Um, more about it uh, in terms of theoretical construct you can i don't know if you mean like statistical because definitely it doesn't it's not a model that will understand your field of research it's not a model that you can say hey i'm doing something in sociology uh please identify the topics for me um so it's it's a, it's a machine method right so it's an algorithm so it has to learn. However, there is some um, structural statistical formulation and you can think about it as a hierarchical Bayesian model uh, in which you have several layers. You have, you can, um, when I was talking about the probabilities, that's important because when you try to construct the likelihood, the joint likelihood in the model, like the probability of having this word uh, in that document uh, talking about this topic and you want to maximize those probabilities, you consider conditionals. You consider the fact that um, uh, uh, the probability of having word omega uh, will be higher uh, in, in a given document will be higher uh, given that the document is referring to this topic. And you will use the data to estimate the parameters in the model, but the conception is that one. Uh, and you will have, I say, a said Bayesian model because you have high uh, hyperparameters in the model about, uh, for instance, I said that a document can be, uh, can have one or several topics behind. Uh, and uh, one of the parameters that I, precised here it's giving an initial value of a hyperparameter in the model saying uh, that there's a uh, more likely probability that a topic uh, that, that the document will address one uh, one or very few uh, that a document will address one or very few topics you can change this value, which is an initial value, like the, the final value could be different, but you can say to the model, start with the idea that every document addresses 15 topics. And the model will start searching for convergence, trying to optimize the likelihood uh, with that condition. And it may change if it finds other regions of optimization that are better. Um, so this is something that you do. So this is a, a statistical construction. I don't know if that helps. It, it does, yeah. Uh, I, I did get an answer, thank you. <laughs> okay. And then there are a few other questions. Uh, so first, what was your reference output from the web of science? And, and secondly, how would you evaluate the re reliability of using machine-driven approach against human-driven methodology such as systematic literature review? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't understand very well about the reference output. Is it about the file that I showed, like the kind of file, the raw, raw data that I showed? Yes? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, so we can uh, open it again. Uh, yes, it was a text file. This is a text file. So what we get is, um, I don't know if you can see very well, but uh, there are these abbre abbreviations uh, and I don't know why Web of Science uh, thinks that we should understand what they mean, uh, but you can kind of interpret that AU means author, so it gives you the list of authors. I don't remember what AF is. Uh, so we had to like either go through the help in Web of Science or interpret it ourselves. But yeah, the, the, that's the kind of format. And it's not very friendly, which is why using the ref split R um, library helped a lot to convert it easily into a data frame. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they also work with Scopus. Yeah. Um, the second question was the reliability of machine. Yeah, so I, before this um, literature review, if we can call it that way, um, the was, that ended up being about 8,000 abstracts. I did a review of our packages that were created to process or analyze movement data. <clears throat> and I did it because I thought that um, there were too many packages. People didn't know how to choose. And probably no one knew how many packages there were. And I was asking myself, like, are they for the same thing? Are they um, actually like a useful contribution? Um, some of the documentations were bad. So I started reviewing them. They were 58 packages in the end in my list. And these are not papers. They are just packages with some with very few functions, some with a lot of functions. And it was so hard to keep all of these 58 packages in my head and trying to get some systematic review from that, try to come up with categories in which I can, like different dimensions in which I could review the packages and like what lessons and general things or very specific things. It was very, very hard for me, and kind of painful <laughs> to have all of that in my head. So I thought if it is painful with 58 packages, there's no way that I'm gonna be able to read and then have in my mind more than 8,000 papers. Because, I mean, we didn't go through it, but I didn't only analyze the abstracts. Um, so in this kind of uh, study, when you're analyzing more than what you think your brain can do, uh, I think that a machine-driven approach is better. Uh, I do think it's not perfect, but I also think that doing it yourself uh, is not perfect either. And as if you check this, uh, the website, there are several stages where we do quality control to make sure that we're just not having fun and saying whatever with our study. So um, there's a quality control section for um, the data collection part where we identify the keywords to make sure that we were doing things right. For the topic analysis part, you can later check uh, some things that we did to find consistency in the topics that we were identifying with heat maps and doing uh, topic uh, word clouds this time with the abstracts to see if there was consistency. Um, for other stuff, there were al always uh, some quality control parts that, let's see where they're like, yeah. So in every section, I talk about accuracy and different measures that we use. So I wanted to make sure that I'm not just letting the, letting the machine run the review and it's actually me who is leading the paper. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, and, and also like from time to time and for the different things, I always decided to run like a, a, a randomly uh, to take a randomly selected sample of abstracts or documents or whatever I was analyzing and reading them myself uh, just to see if what the machine was identifying made sense. I would also like take a random example of every topic 
uh, a random sample of abstracts of every topic and then read them as well to see, oh, yeah, of course. Like, since we had uh, also like the gamma gives you the prevalence of a topic in each document, you can check which papers have, like for topic one, which papers have the higher gamma, the highest gamma, and you take the, I don't know, the top 10 or something, and then you read their abstracts and you see, okay, if these are the, the papers that are mostly identified with this topic, do they make sense? Does the topic make sense to be called social interactions? Are these abstracts about social interactions? So I did the same for all of the topics. And I asked one of my co-authors eventually to take a look as well, because sometimes I can be like so into that research that I may not have uh, this new or refreshing external point of view. So that, that helped too. So I think it's a mixture. You should never just l uh, let the machine drive your research. Yeah. And I think there was uh, one more question. Uh, so, well, a little bit related to, to the whole discussion of how much machine learning <laughs> or machine approach and how much human approach um, uh, there is. Uh, so why did you choose 15 topics or how do you determine uh, the number of topics that you then, um, yeah, choose. <laughs> yeah, that's very controversial, right? So I explained that I uh, tried five, ten, also um, went for more. The thing is, at the beginning, I was using the per the perplexity score, and I was trying five, ten, twenty, twenty-five, um, thirty, and so on, and I was seeing that the score didn't reached to a maximum, or I think it was a minimum, I really don't remember, but it really didn't go to an optimum and either stay there or uh, go worse. So there was always, so the score was telling me that the optimal number was higher, the num optimal number of, of topics was higher than 30. And the truth is that I cannot interpret more than that. And again, I, asked for, for help to my co-authors and I said, hey, am I the only one who's not being able to interpret these topics? And they were saying the same thing. And in the end, I just decided, okay, I'm just gonna run from five to 25, uh, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, and I'm going to decide which one gives me more interpretable topics that actually make sense and that are not too general or too specific. And I'm going to ask the same question to my co-authors. And we all said 15. Now, I also tried uh, between 10, 10 and 15, so 11, 12, uh, and then what if 16? And it kind of gave very similar results to 15. So like 11 was too few, but like, 13, 14, 15, 16, which kind of giving very similar results in terms of interpretability. Um, so we just decided to fix it in 15 because it sounded, <laughs> this is not a very good scientific explanation, but it sounded better to say 15 than 14 <laughs> when you don't really have a, a, a choice, like a, a very particular or strong choice for one of the or the other. That, that's the answer. So, yeah, do you know if, it, if, if this is possible for other languages, like for Italian, here is a question. I don't know if, all, oh, okay. Um, I'm pretty sure that the LDA function is not, does not work with Italian. However, all the different steps, <laughs> yeah, Georgian, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, all the different steps that I uh, suggested can be done. Like the logic is works for all the languages. Uh, the thing is, the question would be in practice, which functions exist already? And if I want to do it in this or that language, um, what functions should I create for myself? Um, because as I said, uh, 
there were there was a function already created to remove stop words in Spanish, and I'm pretty sure that there were other languages. Probably Italian was there. Um, but for the modeling part, I would guess that you would have to, huh, wait. No, actually, LDA, it has no reason to not work for Italian. You just have to make sure that you clean up. If it is, it's the same alphabet, so it should be able to detect words. And what you want is LDA to be able to detect words, have some frequency count of the words, and a DOI for each document. Once you have that, yeah, it can work for Italian. Um, the only thing is that you have to make sure that you have cleaned the words and you have taken out all the prepositions, all the stop words, all the numbers, um, all the words like by hand, the things that I showed in, in the script that I did manually. Um, you have to make sure and that's it. Yeah. It does not, I mean, I don't, I don't speak Italian, so I don't know if there's like some like regional stuff, but I would say that you don't really need something like a British and um, American dictionary is the one I said. So there's no need for a dictionary to do LDA. There could be a need for a dictionary to clean words and to lemmatize. I don't know if there's a function to lemmatize in Italian. So you should either create one uh, or see if there are some Italian researchers that have worked on it or decide not to lemmatize and to use just the outputs without that part uh, into the LDA, LDA and then see if the outcomes make sense or if you need to clean more. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we've had a very good uh, introduction. Uh, does anybody else have a question or questions about this topic or um, because you, you mentioned before that you have been also doing something um, similar with other topics or with other text analysis. So I was just wondering if you could maybe briefly mention what are these other projects that you have been doing. Yeah, sure. So it's the same project. So I'm just going to go to the website. And if you go through the sections, there's uh, the third one's data analysis. And we just saw topic analysis. But let's go to, for instance, this one, software. And one of the questions that I wanted to um, answer in the paper was uh, which software were more popular? in the movement ecology literature. And this was a completely different approach because I would say that um, we can call topic modeling a non-supervised or unsupervised approach where you don't know what the topics are. But in this case, you know the software, you know which software people could be using. So it was a completely different analysis. And what we did was, okay, we're going to create something like a dictionary and we are going to start with a list of different software that we think people could have been using and then ask other people to like help us complete the list and so on so we ended up with 33 software in our list r python spss and so on um is that out there oh yeah 28 <laughs> so um we created a dictionary why because Okay, so other things where here the document is not only the abstract. And the reason for that is that it's very uncommon to see software cited in an abstract, at least in, in, in a field that it's not about software. Um, and sometimes you will have it in the title because it's someone who created a package for that specific field. Uh, maybe you will have it in the keywords, maybe sometime in the abstract, but in most cases, if people are citing software, it's going to be in the material method section. So I had to do a lot of analysis, and there's also, uh, there are details and codes here, 
uh, to download the whole paper. And, to, uh, and I had papers in XML format and in PDF format. XML is so easy to work with. It's so lovely. PDF is just a pain. Uh, and I, in many cases, I extracted the words into R and then all the letters were separated by a space. So you could not tell when a word began and when it ended. Um, also, if you think about uh, scientific papers, like the format is different and it depends on the journal, like a, a PDF, right? So in some cases you would have two columns. In some cases you would have authors in one column, abstract in the other column, and then everything else in two other columns with different wi width. Uh, in other cases you would have authors uh, above then abstract in one column, and then you would have separation of two columns. Then you would also have to account by the fact that the two columns end in a page and then begins in another page. But so I would, I would have to try to figure out how to take extract all the text in R and then join it into the same column and like have a whole text in one column, the whole text of the paper in one column, taking into account the fact that things change when you break the page. So there were a lot of things that I had to work on and then try to figure out how to, um, how to identify where the material method section started and ended. And in some papers, it's after introduction, but in some other papers, it's after the discussion. So it, it was a mess, but I did an algorithm to do that. Uh, and once we had the material method section, we were able to look for the um, the software. But then there's another problem. If you're going to look for R, what are you going to ask? Where is the letter R in the text? Like, <laughs> there are so many R's that can appear in the text, and it doesn't mean that people are using R. So we had to come up, that's why I said dictionary, uh, with, like, we would have for each, let's see, let's uh, imagine a CSV file and one column per software. And in each row, uh, in each row, we would have something that could be an expression that people would use for each software, like um, our computing software, or our programming software, or our language. And we would try to uh, find that. Python as well. Like, what if they are talking about snakes and not the actual software? So we, were, we had a lot of trouble and we had to come up with this dictionary and then again do quality control on what we were finding to check if we were finding the right thing or not. Uh, and that was a, a very, again, a completely different type of analysis. And here, I think you can see it still. Uh, there's the output of the five main software tools used uh, in movement ecology in the last decade. And something really interesting is that R has completely changed like the the trend is so strong and um the other ones that were that are also main software used are all decreasing and uh, probably because of r so yeah this is some kind of analysis that i did i also did um the same type of analysis to see what were the tracking devices used so gps accelerometer video cameras and so on um, I did a survey, so I asked people to, like, researchers in movement ecology to give me their impressions about movement ecology. So the whole survey is here, um, and yeah, so these are the impressions of the people, the analysis, and actually if you go to the GitHub repository that is, that is hosting and creating this website, um, if you go there, you have, um, so ch chapter three was survey. If you open the uh, markdown file, you'll see the whole code that was used to analyze the survey. So actually to create that website, uh, it runs this code. So it reanalyzes the survey again. It's, it takes a little bit of time, but it's like a couple of minutes or three minutes. Um, 
so the whole code to analyze a survey is there. Um, that is more quantitative analysis. What else did I want to show? Oh, so the part where I say we downloaded the whole manuscript and extracted the material and method section are here. So in section two, you can see how we, uh, we used the full text package to download papers, how we used it, the kind of um, um, rationality behind trying to identify the material and method sections in XML scientific papers. And for some reason I didn't copy, oh yeah. So XML here and PDF here. And the codes are, are here. If you click on XML and PDF, you can access the codes. 